Welcome to the lecture on cardiovascular system function. There will be subsequent lectures discussing nursing care of the cardiovascular patient. Today, we'll be discussing the cardiovascular system, sometimes called the circulatory system. This system helps bring oxygen and nutrients to the cells of the body, carry hormones from one part of the body to, the no to another, and remove metabolic waste products. In this chapter, we'll discuss anatomy and physiology of the heart and its vessels, Te techniques used when obtaining a history and physical assessment to help target cardiac function, treatments and medication regimens used to promote cardiac health, common diagnostic testing and cardiovascular disorders. There are currently millions of people in the United States suffering from some type of cardiac disorder or disease. You'll be dealing with cardiovascular patients more and more frequently. To provide effective care for these patients, you must have a clear understanding of the cardiovascular system and how it functions, as well as diagnostic testing and treatments used for these patients. Controlled by the autonomic nervous system, the heart pumps blood to all the organs and tissues throughout the body. It's transported through the vessels known as arteries and veins. These carry the blood throughout the body and keep the heart filled with blood to maintain blood pressure. The heart spans the area from the second to the fifth intercostal space. It lies beneath the sternum in the mediastinum between the lungs. The heart's broad part or base is at its upper right and its pointed end or apex is at its lower left. The apex is also called the point of maximal impulse and is where heart sounds can be heard the loudest. The exact location of the heart can vary slightly with each patient. Surrounding the heart is a thin pericardial sac. This thin sac protects the heart. It has an outer or parietal layer and an inner or visceral layer that forms the epicardium. Between the two layers is 10 to 30 mLs of fluid, known as pericardial fluid. This fluid prevents friction and allows the heart to glide as it pumps. There are four chambers within the heart, two atria located in the upper portion and two ventricles located in the lower portion. The septum divides them. The right side of the heart controls pulmonary circulation to the lungs. The left side of the heart controls systemic circulation to the body. The atria have thin walls and serve as chambers for blood. They help eject the amount of blood moving into the lower ventricles, which fill primarily by gravity. Within the heart are several valves that ensure that blood moves in a one-way direction only, and that's forward, with no regurgitation or backflow. The first valves we'll talk about are the atrial ventricular valves. These separate the atria from the ventricles. They are the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve. I try to remember them by the tricuspid having three versus two, so that is on the right side of the atrium. For most people, the right side of the body is stronger, so I try to attribute tri to the stronger side or the right atrium, and it's located between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The bicuspid valve is also sometimes called the mitral valve, and that is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Each valve has leaflets or cusps, and these anchor uh, the valve to the heart wall with cords of fibrous tissue called chordae tendinae. The cusp of the valves act to maintain tight closure. The tricuspid valve has three cuffs, cusps and the mitral valve has two. Each of the semilunar valves also has three cusps. Semilunar valves prevent blood from flowing back into the ventricles. They are the pulmonic valve and the aortic valve. The pulmonic valve 
is located between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, and the aortic valve is located between the left ventricle and the aorta. The heart relaxes during diastole and fills with blood. As pressure in the ventricles drops below pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary artery, blood begins to back up towards the ventricles. The pressure of that blood causes the aortic and the pulmonic valves to snap shut so the blood doesn't flow backwards. This causes the second heart sound of S2 and the atrials begin to fill, starting the cardiac cycle. Ventricular contractions during systole send blood out to the heart and the body. There are two phases of systole. Pressure within the ventricles begins to rise. This causes the mitral and the tri tricuspid valves to snap shut making the first heart sound of S1. Pressure in the ventricles begins to rise. It rises higher than the pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary artery. This pressure causes the aortic and the pulmonic valves to open and blood is ejected into the pulmonary artery, out to the lungs and into the aorta and out to the rest of the body. The vascular system of the heart consists of artery, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. It's constantly filled with about five liters of blood, delivering oxygen, nutrients, and other substances to the cells of the body and removing waste products. Pulmonary circulation begins at the right ventricle, pumping deoxygenated blood to the lungs for gas exchange at the alveoli. The oxygenated blood is returned to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. This is the only time oxygenated blood goes through a vein. Systemic circulation begins in the left ventricle, pumping oxygenated blood to the aorta, many branches which give rise to the capillaries in the tissue. Deoxygenated blood returns to the right atrium through the superior inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. Hepatic portal circulation is a special part of the systemic circulation. Blood from the capillaries of the digestive organs and spleen flows through the portal vein and to the sinusoids in the liver before returning to the heart. This allows the liver to regulate blood levels of nutrients such as glucose, amino acids, and iron and remove potential toxins such as alcohol or medications from circulation. Arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart to the body. The only exception is the pulmonary artery, which carries deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. Veins carry blood toward the heart, deoxygenated blood. The only exception is the pulmonary vein which carries oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. Arteries work under high pressure, so they have thick elastic walls to help move the blood through the system. Veins have thinner, more pliable walls to accommodate the different variations in blood volume and pressure. Veins also have valves that prevent blood from flowing backwards. Pulses come from our arteries. They are waves of pressure that are generated when the heart pumps. You can feel these waves of pressure or these pulsations if the artery lies near the skin. And you can palpate these as peripheral pulses, such as temporal, carotid, radial, uh, posterior tibial, dorsalis pedis, etc. The pulse points may vary between patients and older adults may have diminished peripheral pulses. The inferior and superior vena cava carry deoxygenated blood into the right atrium. The pulmonary artery delivers venous blood to the lungs. The pulmonary veins deliver oxygenated blood to the left atrium, and the aorta delivers oxygenated blood from the heart 
to all the body's cells and tissues. So this diagram represents the blood flow of the heart. Uh, the blue vessels represent the veins and the red ves vessels represent the arteries. Uh, the only exception to the rule there is the pulmonary artery is going to be blue because it's the only artery carrying deoxygenated blood. And the pulmonary vein is going to be red because that's the only vein carrying oxygenated blood. Um, the two major veins that bring the blood to the heart, uh, the right side of the heart, are the superior and inferior vena cava. And those are going to deliver that deoxygenated blood into the right atrium. The blood then goes mostly by gravity into the right ventricle. And then the right ventricle pumps that blood into the pulmonary artery. The artery carries the deoxygenated blood into the lungs where it becomes oxygenated. Uh, next through the pulmonary veins, um, they carry the oxygenated blood back to the left atrium. It's then pumped into the left ventricle. And then our left ventricle, which is our really strong pump, will pump it into the aorta and that carries the blood that's oxygenated back out through the body. And then it starts the process all over again, back into the veins as it's used. Coronary arteries supply the heart muscle with oxygen-rich blood so it can function properly. The oxygen-depleted blood must also be carried away. The coronary ostea supplies the myocardium with the oxygen-rich blood, and the coronary veins carry the carbon dioxide or the deoxygenated blood away through the inferior and superior vena cava. The two main coronary arteries are the left and right main coronary arteries. The left main coronary artery supplies blood to the left side of the heart muscle, the left ventricle and the left atrium and then it divides off into several other branches such as the circumflex artery which encircles the heart muscle and supplies blood to the outer side and the back of the heart. The right coronary artery supplies blood to the right ventricle, the right atrium, the SA and the AV nodes which regulate the heart rhythm. The right coronary artery then divides off into smaller branches that help perfuse other parts of the heart. Since coronary arteries deliver blood to the heart muscle, if it's diseased, such as in coronary artery disease, it can reduce the flow of oxygen to the heart and nutrients to the heart muscle. This can lead to a heart attack or an MI and possibly death. The coronary artery becomes completely blocked. Um, this can happen in disease processes such as atherosclerosis where there's plaque built up inside the artery and it causes it to become either narrow or blocked. And this is one of the most common causes of heart disease. A few of the smaller vessels that we didn't talk about are the arterioles, the venules, and the capillaries. So uh, the capillaries help deliver oxygen and metabolic substances to the cells. This is where the um, exchange of fluids, nutrients, and metabolic wastes occur because the capillaries are thin and very permeable, meaning things can easily go through them or tr be transported across them. And they're connected to the arterioles and the veins through those smaller vessels called arterioles and venules. The conduction system of the heart helps initiate and conduct electrical impulses required for the heart to contract and therefore pump blood. So now we're gonna talk about these components. Um, the heart has two different types of cardiac cells, electrical and myocardial or working. The electrical cells make up the conduction system of the heart 
and they're distributed in an orderly fashion throughout the heart. They possess specific properties, such as automasticity, which is the ability to spontaneously generate and discharge an electrical impulse, uh, excitability, which is the ability of the cell to respond to an electrical impulse, and conductivity, which is the ability uh, to transmit an electrical impulse from one cell to the next. And then the uh, myocardial cells, which uh, make up the muscular walls of the atrium and the ventricles of the heart, and they possess the specific properties of contractility, which is the ability of the cell to shorten and lengthen its fibers, and extensibility, which is the ability of the cell to uh, stretch. Depolarization and repolarization. During polarization, the cardiac cells are at rest, meaning no electrical activity is taking place. Remember that electrical impulses are generated by automasticity of these specialized cardiac cells. So once the electrical cell generates that electrical impulse, the impulse causes ions to cross the cell membrane and create an action potential, referred to as depolarization. So during depolarization, we have an electrical impulse, and that electrical impulse causes the cardiac muscle to contract. The action potential curve itself shows electrical changes in the myocardial cell during the depolarization repolarization cycle, and it's that electrical activity that's detected on an EKG, not the actual muscular activity. During the refractory period, the cells are able to resist the electrical stimulation um, no matter how strong, um, so that um, it cannot cause another depolarization. Repolarization is the return of ions to their previous resting state, which corresponds with the relaxation of the myocardial cell. It's a type of electrical activity that causes muscular activity and repolarization on this diagram. You can see uh, the reflection that it shows on the um, EKG. The um, polarized shows no deflection because the ions on the outside and on the inside are equal or electrically balanced, so it's completely resting and uh, there's no movement there. And then um, for depolarization, um, you're generating that electrical impulse, and so it's shown as a positive deflection on the EKG. Now let's talk a little bit more about how these uh, impulses occur. So contractions of the heart occur in a rhythm called the cardiac cycle, and they're regulated by impulses that begin at the SA node. The SA node, located in the wall of the right atrium, alters its firing rate to meet the body's needs. Electrical impulses are conducted to regulate a normal heartbeat. Impulses are sent by the autonomic nervous system that affect the SA node. The AV node is specialized cardiac muscle fibers, and it's located in the center of the heart between the atria and the ventricles. It conducts the normal electrical impulses from the atria to the ventricles. It also slows down the rate of the electrical impulse to allow the atria to completely empty into the ventricles so that no blood is left behind. The bundle of his is a collection of heart muscle cells that are specialized for electrical conduction. They transmit the electrical impulses from the AV node to the point of the apex of the fascicular branches through the bundle branches leading to the Purkinje fibers. This slide shows the SA node, also known as the pacemaker of the heart, which sends those electrical impulses at a rate of 60 to 100 per minute based on what the body needs. And as those impulses travel down through the AV node, the AV node is going to slow those impulses down a little bit, 
allow those atria to completely empty into the ventricles, and then um, the rate will speed up again, and it will uh, the impulse will go on down into the bundle of his, into the bundle of branches, and the Purkin G fibers, and the Purkin G fibers will send the impulses to the ventricular areas, and it will spread and cause those ventricles to contract. And that will shoot the blood out to, um, from the left side, up through the aorta and out to the body. And on the right side, back into the lungs to be uh, reoxygenated. Together, the right and left bundle branches and Purkin G fibers send electrical impulses to the muscles of both ventricles so that they contract simultaneously. And as they contract simultaneously, the right ventricle sends blood that's deoxygenated to the lungs to be reoxygenated, and the left ventricle sends oxygenated blood up through the aorta and out to the body. After the electrical cells have initiated the impulse and conducted it through the heart, the mechanical cells respond by contracting and pumping blood. The heart will respond with contraction only if it is stimulated by electrical activity. You cannot have a mechanical response if there is no electrical stimulus. After the electrical cells have discharged their stimuli, the mechanical cells are expected to respond by contracting. What parameters are used to determine whether or not the heart is pumping adequately? The blood pressure and the pulse. What external evidence is used to evaluate the heart's electrical activity? And that is the EKG or the electrocardiogram. When would you expect to have electrical activity or a viable EKG tracing, but no mechanical response? This may occur when the heart muscle is failing and not able to contract in response to the electrical stimulus because it is too weak or damaged, such as in heart failure. To evaluate a patient's cardiac function, you must assess mechanical function by examining pulse and blood pressure. Electrical cardiac function is examined by analyzing EKG tracings. EKG tracings are designed to give a graphic display of the electrical activity in the heart, and it looks at the cardiac rhythm and rate. The cardiac cycle consists of the period from one heartbeat to the beginning of the next, and it has two phases, systole and diastole. In systole, the ventricles contract at the beginning. Blood pressure in the ventricles forces the AV valves, the mitral and the tricuspid to close, and the semilunar valves, the pulmonic and the aortic to open. As the ventricles contract, the blood pressure in them builds up until the semilunar valves begin to open. This allows the ventricles to eject the blood into the aorta and the pulmonary artery. In diastole, the ventricles empty and relax. Ventricular pressure falls below the pressure in the pulmonary artery and the aorta. As diastole begins, the semilunar valves close to prevent backflow of blood into the ventricles. The mitral and tricuspid valves open, allowing blood to flow into the ventricles from the atria. When the ventricles become full near the end of this phase, the atria contract to send the remaining blood to the ventricles, then a new cardiac cycle begins as the heart enters systole again. Cardiac output refers to the amount of blood that the left ventricle is able to pump in one minute, or the amount of blood able to be pumped out to the body in one minute. It's equal to the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume, or the amount of blood ejected with each heartbeat. Output equals rate times volume. The stroke volume in turn depends on three major factors, preload, contractility, and afterload. Tissue perfusion is dependent on good cardiac output or proficient cardiac output. Cardiac output can change according to the body's needs. A patient's cardiac output could be affected if there was a change in the heart rate, if they had some sort of cardiac arrhythm, 
if there was a decrease or an increase in their blood volume or a change in the heart's ability to contract, uh, if it was decreased um, and it wasn't able to contract as well, or if they were taking certain types of medication or had some sort of cardiac disease. Now, preload is the amount of blood that is returning to the right side of the heart. So that's that deoxygenated blood that's coming back um, from the body. And afterload is the amount of pressure in the aorta and in the peripheral arteries that the left ventricle has to pump against to get that blood out to the body. So the ventricle is actually pumping against the systemic blood pressure trying to get that blood out. And that systemic blood pressure is referred to as resistance. And the peripheral arteries cause the most resistance, um, which is why the left side of the heart is often thicker um, or the um, thickest side of the heart. And then contractility is simply the heart's ability to contract. When we measure blood pressure, we're measuring the force of the blood against the blood vessel walls. Normal blood pressure would be a systolic of less than 120, but greater than 90, and a diastolic of less than 80, but greater than 60. Normal blood pressure is high enough to allow for filtration for the nourishment of the tissues, but low enough to prevent rupture of the vessels. Regulation of the heart rate. The autonomic nervous system influences regulation of the heart rate through the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic or adrenergic system can increase the heart rate by releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine. These chemicals increase heart rate, contractibility, automasticity, and AV conduction. The parasympathetic or the cholinergic nervous system can decrease the heart rate. One of the nerves, the vagus nerve, when stimulated, can slow heart rate and AV conduction. Cardiac output is the amount of blood ejected by the heart in one minute and is measured in liters. Normal cardiac output is between four and eight liters per minute. Cardiac output is dependent upon both heart rate and stroke volume. And stroke volume is simply the volume of blood ejected during systole. A few hormones that affect the heart are epinephrine, which is secreted by the adrenal medulla during increased times of stress, and this is going to increase the heart rate, increase the force of the heart's contractions. It will dilate our coronary vessels and increase cardiac output and therefore increase the systolic blood pressure. Uh, AMP, also called atrial natriotic peptide, this is secreted when there is a higher blood pressure or a greater blood volume in the atria and it causes the walls of those atria to stretch and they release this AMP. In turn, um, it restricts things like um, or it affects the levels of things like aldosterone, uh, ADH, and um, renin. And so it causes sodium to be lost and that sodium is accompanied by water in the urine and it will decrease the blood volume and the blood pressure. So it might be benefit to, beneficial to a patient who is in either fluid volume overload or heart failure. And then aldosterone, which helps regulate the sodium and potassium levels, both of which are needed for electrical activity of the myocardium. Potassium is especially critical because even small deviations in the potassium levels can impair the rhythmic contractions of the heart. Now, as the patient ages, we see a lot of changes with the cardiovascular system. Um, for one, we'll see more dysrhythmias or arrhythmias, same thing. And this is due to the conduction cells are less effective. Remember those um, conduction cells, they have little things going on with them like automasticity, transmitting impulses. So if those aren't working, um, it can affect the SA node, the AV node, and cause dysrhythmias. Uh, atherosclerosis, which is that buildup of plaque, and it causes the vessels to become narrow and rough. Um, the pieces of plaque can break off, 
uh, clots can form. And it can also just narrow the vessels by a buildup of the plaque, and that can cause a decrease in the amount of blood flow to the heart and other organs. Also, the resting blood pressure starts to increase. Our, the left ventricle of the heart, the workload increases. Patients are at more risk for left-sided heart failure. And because of the um, resting blood pressure increasing, it places the patient at a higher risk for a stroke. You also may see a, dis a decrease in the heart rate and that can lead to fatigue. And then um, the vein valves become incompetent. Um, the skeletal muscle is really needed to help with those valves and sometimes that's the issue. And so patients start to develop venous stasis and uh, so they have pooling of the blood of the vein or backflow of the blood it's staying there it's not going back towards the heart like it's supposed to and so they can develop ulcers in their legs cardiovascular disease is the number one killer a healthy lifestyle is recommended starting with smoking cessation and reducing fat in one's a daily dietary consumption the american heart association recommends at least two servings of fish weekly uh, fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, herring, lake trout, sardines, um, or any other fish that's high in omega-3 fatty acids. And then a uh, prescribed exercise walking program, which would help promote blood flow and help with skeletal muscle contraction, reduce symptoms of peripheral vascular disease, and um, after discharge for the hospital, exercise three times a week for 20 to 30 minutes is highly encouraged. A nationwide Go Red for Women was instituted several years ago by the American Heart Association. This is a nationwide movement to celebrate the power women have to band together to wipe out heart disease. That's especially important because heart disease isn't always treated as seriously in women. And uh, so, you know, women need to take a stance on that and make sure that if they're having symptoms that they thoroughly get checked out and insist that cardiac testing be done if they feel um, that they're at risk. The color red and the red dress are linked with this ability. Assessment of the cardiovascular patient. Be sure to get a thorough history, a past medical history, and family history. Does the patient have any previous cardiac issues? What is the familial and genetic predisposition of the patient? This can help us determine future outcomes for the patient or potential testing that we should do. Does the patient take any prescription or non-prescription drugs or have they in the past? How about illicit drugs or alcohol? Be sure to perform a physical exam. Look at the overall general appearance of the patient. Is the patient experiencing any ischemia, chest pain, or leg pain? How are their vital signs? Do they currently or have they had a fever? How is their pulse rate? What is the rhythm? How is the volume? Do they have any pulse deficits? How is their respiratory rate? Are they using any accessory muscles to breathe with? And how is their blood pressure? The heart's electrical activity is the pattern displayed on the EKG or the heart rhythm. An abnormal rhythm is called an arrhythmia or a dysrhythmia. Arrhythmias are a graphic representation of the heart's electrical activity. Telemetry is used to record that activity. This is called an EKG or ECG tracing, and it is used to evaluate the electrical activity of the heart. The period of contraction that the heart undergoes while it pumps blood into circulation is called systole. The period of relaxation that occurs as the chambers fill with blood is called diastole. We're just going to do a brief overview of the EKG here. Uh, there will be subsequent videos to follow this that talk to you about uh, how to uh, recognize different types of EKGs and how to uh, record the rate and recognize and different types of arrhythmias on the EKG. But this one is just going to be a brief discussion of what the actual EKG is and what each wave on there represents. 
So uh, if you look at the EKG here, you have a P wave, uh, which is that little hump with the P over it. And then you have a QRS wave, uh, where you'll see the upward uh, deflection on the graph. Um, the flat line represents the uh, isometric line. So anywhere where the line is flat, um, that's considered isometric. And then you have the T wave. Um, there could be other waveforms on here. This is just a normal EKG, so there are no other types of waveforms on here. Now, initially, both the atria and the ventricles are relaxed or in diastole. And remember, when the diastole is occurring, uh, they're filling. The, the atria are filling up um, to prepare. And then the P wave represents a depolarization of the atria, which is followed by atrial contraction or systole. So then um, the atria start to contract, and that's going to help push that blood down into those ventricles. Atrial systole extends until the QRS complex, at which point the atrial relax. So those atria will start to relax and fill again. And the QRS is going to represent the polarization of the ventricles. So the ventricles are going to depolarize, and that's going to be followed by ventricular contraction. The ventricles are start to contract and send that blood out to from the right side to the lungs to be oxygenated, and from the left side to the body to perfuse the tissues. The T wave represents the repolarization of the ventricles and marks the beginning of ventricular relaxation. So remember where you see diastole, that represents the filling process, and whenever you see systole, that represents the contraction process. Mechanical activity is evaluated by assessing pulses and blood pressure. Palpate for peripheral pulses or auscultate for the apical heart rate. Be sure to put the stethoscope directly on the skin and listen to the apical pulse for a minimum of one minute. Normal heart sounds are S1 and S2, also known as the lub dub. These represent the closing of the heart valves that we discussed earlier. And these valves, remember, they're closing to prevent that backflow of blood. They're best heard at the apex of the heart which is located at the fifth intercostal space midline. Abnormal heart sounds such as S3 can represent a ventricular gallop. S4 can represent an atrial gallop. You may also hear things like murmurs and clicks or a friction rub. S3 can be normal for children and young adults and it sounds like a gallop. It's a low pitched sound and usually heard early in diastole. In some older adults, S3 may be heard. S3 can represent left-sided heart failure, fluid volume overload, or mitral valve regurgitation. S4 is also a low-pitched sound similar to a gallop and it can be heard late in diastole. It can occur with hypertension, coronary artery disease, or pulmonary stenosis. True or false, the EKG can't tell you about the heart's mechanical activity. You have to assess the patient's pulse and blood pressure. This is true. The EKG can't tell you about the heart's mechanical activity. In order to learn about the mechanical activity, you must assess the patient's pulse and blood pressure. True or false, the EKG can tell you about the electrical activity. This data is provided in the form of recognizable patterns called arrhythmias. True, the EKG can tell you about electrical activity in the form of recognizable patterns called arrhythmias. There are five areas for listening to the heart. Be sure to put the stethoscope directly to the skin. And when you listen at the mitral or the apex of the heart, be sure to listen for one full minute. 
The aortic valve is located in the right second intercostal space. The pulmonic valve is located at the left second intercostal space. Herb's point is located at the left third intercostal space. The tricuspid valve is located at the lower left sternal border fourth intercostal space. And the mitral valve is located at the left fifth intercostal medial to mid clavicular line. I like to remember them by a pet for mom, or all people enjoy Time Magazine. Whichever one works for you, um, that's the best one. And so when you do your uh, assessment, if you can remember one of those mnemonics, it'll help you remember where each point is that you should be listening to. A normal heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. In our athletic people, we may find that rate to be a bit slower. Our pulses. Arterial pulses are palpated for volume and pressure quality. They're palpated bilaterally and then compared for equality. So we're looking at left versus right. Quality is described on a four-point scale as follows. Zero represents absent. One plus represents weak and thready. Two plus is normal. And three plus represents full and bounding. And we're looking at all peripheral pulses, radial pulses, leg pulses bilaterally. And again, we're checking the presence versus the absence and the strength. Be sure to monitor the skin in your cardiac patients for changes in color. Assess for cyanosis and pallor. Cyanosis can appear as a blue tint around the lips or the nail beds, and pallor can appear as paleness or no color. Color changes to the mucous membranes lips, earlobes, skin, and nail beds can also occur. Look for sparse hair growth, especially in the lower extremities. Look also monitor for thickening or clubbing of the nails and look for other varicosities. Monitor the extremities for changes in the temperature. Pocleothermy can occur with insufficient arterial blood flow. The area of the skin will become the area of the environment surrounding it. Monitor for peripheral edema. Edema can be pitting or non-pitting. In pitting edema, when we press on the skin, it leaves an indent, depending on how deep the indent is on how we scale it. The higher the scale, the, higher, the deeper the indent, and the scale goes from plus one to plus four. Edema can occur from right-sided heart failure, gravity, or altered venous blood return. Sometimes this occurs in the elderly because the skeletal muscle pump is not working as well. Weight gain can also occur in these cardiac patients, and that usually indicates edema. We need to monitor our patient's daily weight. A change in a daily weight of two to three pounds or a weekly weight of five pounds should be immediately reported to the MD because this can indicate worsening of heart failure. Look for jugular vein distension. Jugular vein distension can indicate increased pressure on the right side of the heart or heart failure. This diagram is showing the changes on the patient's fingernails over time when they have cardiac disease and hypoxia. So with the nails in the early stages, there can be a 160 degree angle as the clubbing becomes more and more severe, that angle changes from 160 and now becomes greater than 180. So just some uh, physical changes that occur to the body with cardiac disease that you would expect to see when you're performing this type of assessment. Another part of the assessment is assessing the point of maximal impulse. We talked about that earlier, um, that it's generally located around the apex of the heart. However, that can vary from patient to patient, but um, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a diagram of where it's normally located and where you may have to point it out for like an NCLEX exam. So when you assess the point of maximal impulse or the PMI, you'll inspect the left anterior chest for a visible PMI. In some patients, you can actually see it uh, tapping or beating against the skin. You use the pads of your fingers and you will palpate at the apex for the PMI. The PMI can be tapping, which is normal. 
sustained, which can suggest left ventricular hypertrophy from hypertension or aortic stenosis or diffuse, and that can suggest a dilated ventricle from congestive heart failure or cardiomyopathy. You will locate the PMI by the interspace and distance in centimeters from the mid-sternal line and be able to assess the location, the amplitude, the duration, and the diameter. This diagram represents the location of the PMI. Remember, it can vary from patient to patient, but I just wanted to give you an idea of where it's located. Uh, some exams may require that you be able to point this out and mark it on a spot, including the uh, NCLEX. So you should know where that PMI is located. This diagram represents the technique used to perform home and sign. Remember that uh, this can be used to help detect a DVT, but if we suspected a DVT, we would definitely not want to perform this on this patient because it could dislodge the DVT and cause the patient to have a pulmonary embolism. We want to monitor uh, our patient's vital signs. We're looking at the blood pressure. Normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. We would perform readings in both arms and compare. If there's a difference in the readings, we would report that to the MD and we would use the arm with the higher measurement for ongoing uh, blood pressures. We're going to look at those respirations. We're going to look at the rate and the work of breathing to see how easily this patient is breathing and make sure they're not in any sort of respiratory distress or that they don't have any increased work of breathing. Sometimes when patients have cardiovascular disease, things like congestive heart failure, uh, we may see an increase in their work of breathing. We're going to monitor the temperature of the extremities and we're going to palpate them bilaterally to compare them. We're looking for any decreases in arterial blood flow because that's going to cause the area that's not being perfused well to feel cooler than the rest of the body. We're going to listen to our patient's lung sounds. For adventitious sounds, such as crackles, wheezes, or gurgles, which could indicate fluid in the lungs, as in fluid overload or heart failure. We're going to look to see if they have any sputum. Uh, if they do, we want to know what's the frequency, what's the amount, what the appearance is. Uh, sputum can indicate different pulmonary complications or heart failure, especially like a pink frothy sputum. We're going to monitor the patient's mental status, uh, looking for cerebral ischemia, confusion, or disorientation. Remember, if the heart is not pumping well or perfusing the tissues well, then that's going to affect the ability of oxygen to reach the blood cells, especially in the brain, and that can alter their mental status. A nurse is examining a client with a history of cardiac disease. An assessment finding indicates cardiac dysfunction includes which of the following? A. Presence of pedal edema. B. Irregular heart rhythm. C, clubbing of the fingers, or D, all of the above. The answer is D, all of the above. And the rationale is abnormal vital signs, including heart rate, abnormal heart sounds, and general appearance changes, including skin, temperature, distended neck veins, clubbing of fingers, and presence of edema are all assessment findings associated with cardiovascular disease. The function of the tricuspid valve is A. Allows blood to flow out of the left ventricle into the aorta. B. Allows blood to flow from the right atrium into the right ventricle. C. Allows blood to flow out of the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. Or D allows blood to flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle.
The answer is B, it allows blood to flow from the right atrium into the right ventricle. Remember, I said the tricuspid valve has three cusps. So if you think about three being stronger, being on the right side of the body, then you can remember that it's located between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And therefore, the tricuspid valve allows the blood to flow from the right atrium into the right ventricle. So your rationale is the function of the tricuspid valve is to prevent blood from returning to the atria when the ventricles contract. The tricuspid valve is located between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The major functions of the cardiovascular system is to perform all of the following except A. Supply of oxygen-rich blood to the tissues. B. Elimination of carbon dioxide. C. Transportation of nutrients. Or D. Exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The answer is D, exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And here's your rationale. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the body and outside the environment is a function of the lungs, known as ventilation, and it's not a primary function of the heart. Now we'll talk about some diagnostic tests performed for the cardiac patient. Lab tests may include serum enzymes and isozymes, serum cholesterol, and lipid analysis. This can uh, monitor cholesterol and lipid levels for things like coronary artery disease and uh, different enzymes or biomarkers for things like uh, heart attack or myocardial infarction. It can also tell us if uh, other enzymes are elevated in regards to uh, heart failure. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about those. Radiography and radionuclide studies which includes things like chest x-ray, which can help show enlargement of the heart. It can also help us determine the size and the position of the heart. Other types of nuclear cardiology, which can show myocardial damage and determine how well the heart functions. There's three types of nuclear cardiology tests, and they include myocardial perfusion, radionuclide angiography, and cardiac positron emission tomography. Uh, in a diagnostic tests when we talk more about those. It'll talk about different preps that are required for each one of these studies. Uh, for radiography, mostly you have to be concerned with uh, any types of dyes that may be given and whether the patient has any allergies. And the main drug that we worry about with uh, is the metformin, which generally has to be held before any type of diet is given for about 48 hours. Uh, echocardiography, which shows functioning of the left ventricle. Uh, if there's any tumors present, it can also determine if the patient has congenital defects, changes in tissue layers of the heart, and then the TEE, also known as transesophageal echocardiography, which gives us a better view of the thoracic area from the inside of the heart. It's done through uh, an endoscopy, and it can show some additional problems that you may not be able to see with a normal echo. MRIs can also be completed on our cardiac patients, and they can evaluate the anatomy of the heart as well as the function. They can look at the blood flow and the perfusion of the heart to ensure that it's perfusing the way it should be. They can look at the metabolism of the heart to make sure the nutrients are being utilized as possible. Patients receiving the MRI may or may not need dye, depending on the test that's being done. If a dye is used, we would want to screen them and ensure that their kidney function is within normal limits first. Dyes can often give people a feeling of flush or warmth, so we want to prepare them for that. And if the patient is on metformin, we would want them to hold it 48 hours before the procedure. If they are receiving the dye, we would also want to make sure they don't have any allergies to the dye. And patient may have anxiety because MRI machines are often closed and some patients feel claustrophobic inside of them. Uh, two different types of EKGs or electrocardiography can be performed, uh, one in the resting state or one during exercise. Also, uh, an ambulatory EKG can be completed with a halter monitor. 
and this can be done over a 24-hour period or over several months. The patient may be asked to record a diary of their activities and symptoms that occur with those activities. And with the exercise EKG, um, a stress test can be done, and this would increase the heart's workload. Exercise electrocardiography testing or a stress test will test the heart during activity. A treadmill is usually involved. If the patient's unable to tolerate exercise, they can be given an IV infusion of Persantine or Adena card, and that will dilate the coronary arteries, stimulating the effects of exercise. These types of tests are used to determine if blood flow is compromised through the heart in such things as coronary artery disease. A cardiac cath can also be completed. Uh, preparation for the cardiac cath may include medication omission, keeping the patient MPO, checking for allergies, um, and then the patient will be given IV fluids and a sedative. Post-procedure, we have to make sure that the patient has a pressure dressing in place that we're uh, assessing the different peripheral pulses, that we're checking vital signs and blood pressure that the patient understands that they need to avoid movement and report any signs and symptoms of pain. Um, we're also gonna monitor the patient for bleeding and they should report any signs of bleeding and we're going to give them large amounts of fluid after the procedure. In coronary arteriography, we're looking at the degree of blockage of the coronary arteries so again, after those procedures, we're going to assess for bleeding and infection and for vascular uh, difficulties by doing complete vascular assessments. For angiocardiography, we're looking at the size and the shape of the heart, its chambers, and the great vessels like the superior and inferior vena cava and the aorta. We're looking for any congenital abnormalities and for aortography, we're looking for aortic aneurysms. For peripheral arteriography, we're looking at any uh, potential risk for occlusive arterial disease or signs and symptoms of the disease itself. And we also may use co different cardiac markers when we do lab work to monitor for things like uh, myocardial infarction. And this would include monitoring levels of creatinine kinase, myoglobin, troponin I and troponin T, homocysteine, and C-reactive protein. And we'll talk about them more uh, in subsequent videos when we talk about uh, that specific disease process of myocardial infarction. We may also test our patients for B-type natriotic peptide or BNP. This is a hormone secreted by the ventricle tissues in the heart and it's secreted in response to increased pressure or volume in the ventricles of the heart that occur when a patient is in heart failure. So the patients have these uh, this extra volume in the ventricles that causes the ventricles to um, stretch and they secrete this BNP hormone. And so a normal BNP hormone would be less than 100. For these patients, it's gonna be mostly between two and 300, but it could be higher than that. We may also have to do coagulation tests on the patient, especially if they're on specific medications for arrhythmias or for heart valve issues. Disclaimer, the purpose of this video is for educational purposes only. It's not intended as medical advice. Procedures may change throughout time as well as nursing interventions.